Now, I'm here with Jenna Fedolino, who is, was a publisher, uh, is now a media advocate and a public relations specialist. So, Jenna, let me start by asking, why does it seem that media likes to promote negative stories uh, around vaping, uh, the people who vape, over the positive stories? Um, negative stories normally appeal to people's emotions. Among journalists, we have a saying that uh, bad news is good news, um, good news is no news, and no news is bad news. So um, unless you can convince an editor that a story is worth publishing, you can't get people to read about the issues. But of course, uh, you don't have to write about bad news all the time to get into the papers. There are a lot of elements of news that we can use. There's the element of significance, relevance, timeliness, um, oddity, and prominence. Um, we can get our stories about the HR in the media by talking about the latest um, studies and clinical evidence about um, vaping um, to satisfy the element of timeliness. We can talk about the impact of tobacco harm reduction on public health to satisfy the element of uh, relevance. And we can also quote experts to satisfy the element of prominence. So there are a lot of ways to get the good news out there to the media. Now that's on a, on a uh, proactive side. On a more reactive note, how do how do we rebut or, or go up against some of the negative things that we see in the media, particularly um, from certain publishers, outlets around um, vaping when they refuse to acknowledge what we would think is peer reviewed science? Um, I think the best way to do it is to rebut negative news or false information immediately after it comes out, preferably within days. Um, editors wouldn't want to publish a story, which is a reaction to a negative one, which appeared about a week or two weeks ago, because you've got to have the element of timeliness there. So the issue is to be ready with facts and scientific evidence so that you can correct this false information immediately. Yeah, I do feel after your presentation, which I found very informative, that I should be using my hands more uh, when asking the questions, but that uh, for now, uh, is it worth to try and get articles published uh, in your local media that promote uh, tobacco harm reduction, vaping, on their own, or is it best to respond to other instances of vaping or tobacco harm reduction getting mentions in the media, sometimes in a negative light? I think we should do both. Um, if a negative article comes out, I think we should rebut it immediately. Um, it, uh, it's very important that you have the element of timeliness there. Uh, the second thing is it's also important that we publish uh, current scientific evidence about THR. And I don't think we will ever run out of articles about tobacco harm reduction because technology is const constantly changing. So there's always a lot of articles that we can publish and share with editors. Yeah. Now... <clears throat> What's the best approach that uh, advocates can take? You can see I'm, t I'm taking I'm using my hands, just as you said. Uh, what is the best approach uh, advocates can take to get their side of the story heard in their either their local media or their national media? The best approach is always to think like an editor. Um, editors normally look for articles that's timely, relevant, significant, sometimes emotional, sometimes a little bit odd. Um, and the other best way to approach this is the use of language. The simpler the language is, the better it is. Uh, if you can get a technical um, 
evidence, a clinical evidence, and be able to put it forward in an easy to read format. I think that's going to be the most effective way to do it. The other thing is that I've, I've dealt with a lot of editors and most of them are smokers. So what I normally do, I sit down with most of them and I discuss the HR, but I also ask them to experience tobacco harm reduction because it's only through this that they can they can have a more compelling way of editing or writing the stories about the issue so i think that's the best mm. approach for that now we talked about uh the the value of having people tell their own story their first person mm. narratives um and we get uh particularly here in australia yeah, I have people who come up and say things like, uh, you know, firstly, on the one hand, that vaping saved them. They they really love vaping. It's something that has got them off smoking when nothing else worked. But on the other hand, we also hear um, cases of people saying, uh, I think that vaping would be really dangerous. Um, I heard from tobacco control agencies that um, vaping's as dangerous as smoking. Um, vaping will, will get my teenage children on to smoking. Uh, how how do we uh, combat those types of stories? How do we um, convince our friends? How do we as advocates work against that? Again, the, the best thing to approach this is to look at the element elements of news stories. If you can get uh, scientific evidence that's mm. cur uh, that uh, came out recently and share this with the media. I think that's the best approach. Mm -hmm. If a negative article comes out, um, there's always a chance for people from groups to approach editors and say, in the interest of fairness, I think you should also uh, publish our side of the story. So these are the things that you can do. Um, yeah, and that's a, particularly uh, a lot of advocates and, and especially people within communities who get their their information often from mass media sources have said that uh, they feel sometimes demoralised that they're not getting their um, side of the story up. So thank you. That's a very good tip for our advocates. Is there is there much value in uh, using those old styles of media, so conventional print, uh, conventional broadcast media are they still relevant in this um, in this environment or is it best to target a message on social media or is it all of the above um, I think it should be both um, social media is very effective in sending the message across to people but social media is not news in fact if you use google there's a separate search category for news uh, which is dedicated for certified media organizations um, in this age of fake news which easily gets spread out um, i think it's very important to deal with conventional print and broadcast media, which have also evolved because they now have websites and social media accounts. They have Facebook pages, Twitter accounts. So I think the best approach is to combine the two. Um, use both social media and use conventional print and broadcast media. I yeah. think that's the best approach. Well, that's it. That's very good advice. I mean, a lot of people who are um, watching at the moment would be trying to get into their own local media markets. And that leads me to my next question, which is, can you do it on your own? Uh, can you try and take this on or do you need specialist uh, PR advice? I know that's tough when I'm asking you as a PR specialist, but uh, is it something which people can do on their own in their communities? Um, you know, Every, every day, editors get dozens of press releases from people they don't know. And most of the time, and from what I learned from my friends who are editors, and having been a publisher myself in the past, most of these press releases normally gets put in the junk mail. Why? Because the editors don't know who sent them. 
it's not because they don't care about the issues that were sent in the press release. It's because they don't know the persons who transmitted the email. You see, in, in, in publishing, um, credibility is very important. So that's where the PR agency comes in. Um, because PR agents normally have a list of editors that they have established rapport and communication with. And because they constantly deal with them, um, your story will have a better chance of getting published by virtue of the fact that the editor already know that you've checked this for accuracy and you've placed scientific uh, data into readable format. That's why in most, uh, most organizations, media relations is part of the communication strategy. Yeah. So, and the, the other part being that a lot of advocates and, and people within their communities often ask, do I need to have a campaign? So do I need to have a, a long lasting, uh, many faceted campaign? Or is this as simple as telling my story? Is it, is it as easy as just telling your story? Um, I would say it's a case-to-case -case basis. Not a lot of organizations would have the capacity to launch or mount a campaign. But there are certain issues, for instance, if you just have to correct a misinformation, um, I think it can be done um, if you can get the story out once. Uh, but if you have the capacity to launch a campaign, it's much better. Um, again, it would, it would boil down to your capacity to communicate to readers and to deal with um, a host of people that you have to talk to. Yeah. Well, this has certainly been informative. Uh, Jenna, I, I would I would love to keep asking you questions. I have many questions in this space, but uh, I think that we can talk about those in the Zoom room after uh, all the presentations are done. That's all we've got time for now. So thank you very much for your time, uh, Jenna. Thank you. And thank we you. will go to our next segment. Thank you.